Hello guys, it is week five of National Lockdown and today we are going to be distracting ourselves from the boredom with some more romantic poetry. So yesterday we read Ozymandias, which is a sonnet by Percy Shelley for the first time. Today for your first task, I want you to recap some of the context that we looked at yesterday. So there are four questions displayed here on the screen and they are also in the um, kind of handout thing which will be attached to the show my homework task. So I want you to use your knowledge that you that you learnt yesterday and answer these four questions. You can look back on your notes, that is fine. And we will go through the answers in just a sec. So pause the video, attempt the questions and then come back to me. Okay. So hopefully you've had a go at those questions. So question one was which Egyptian pharaoh was Ozymandias inspired by? And the answer for this question is Ramesses II. Now, if you watched yesterday's video, you'll know that Ramesses II was a real pharaoh. Um, and the statue of him which inspired this poem was discovered by some Egyptian um archaeologists in the early 19th century when when um, Percy Shelley was writing and a piece of the statue was delivered to the British Museum uh, just a couple of years after Shelley wrote his poem. Now Shelley never saw this statue but he was inspired to write the poem as was his friend and they had this competition to see who could write the best sonnet about Ozymandias and Ozymandias is the name that Ramesses II um, was known by the Greeks they knew him as Ozymandias. Okay, question number two. List two of Shelley's strongly held beliefs. Now, he could have had anything from vegetarianism, atheism, free love, uh, hatred of the monarchy, and authority figures. You could have had any of those. Now the most important one as we said yesterday especially for understanding this poem is that hatred of the monarchy and authority figures but as you can see Shelley was a pretty interesting character. He was quite ahead of his time being a vegetarian and atheist and believing in free love when at the time marriage and monogamy was very much prized in English society. Okay. So question three is what type of poem is Ozymandias? And Ozymandias, as I mentioned earlier, is a sonnet. In a later lesson, we will look in more detail at the sonnet form and why Shelley chose to write Ozymandias as a sonnet. But for now, all you need to know is it is a 14 line poem that is usually about love. Obviously, this one is not about love and that is something we'll discuss at a later date. Um, and it's written in iambic pentameter, which is like the beating of the human heart. Okay, question four, final question. Which important Gothic writer was Shelley married to? This is just a bit of a biographical detail, which is quite interesting um, that you might want to remember. So Shirley was married to Mary Godwin. He did have another wife, um, but he kind of became estranged from her when he fell in love with Mary Godwin, who would later go on to write Frankenstein. So she was also a really important literary figure at the time she wrote that very seminal and enduring novel Frankenstein. Okay so today our main focus for today is to understand the poem Ozymandias. So we're going to do a bit of light analysis but we're not going to go into too much detail in terms of the language analysis today. I just want you to understand the key images and metaphors in the poem. But first of all we are going to look in a little bit more detail at the title. So as you know the title is Ozymandias, and that is the name of the figure who is depicted in the statue. We know that that is Ramesses II, who was known as Ozymandias by the Greeks. Okay, so he's kind of the titular character. That is the title of the poem. But we can look at this in a little bit more depth and break it down because Ozymandias, we can split that into two parts. So the first part is Ozzy, which means which is from the Greek, osium, meaning to breathe. And then we can have the second part of the word, which is mandius, and it, that comes from the word mandate, which means to rule. So essentially, Ozymandias, this figure, lives and breathes power because osium means to breathe. 
So first of all, we've got this clear message in the title of the poem that this figure is all about power. This man is all about the power that he exercises and how um, he can convey that through this huge statue. OK, so that is the important bit to know about Ozymandias and the name. Right. So now we're going to look at the poem. And we are going to go through it and make sure that we understand it properly before we have a look at any analysis. OK, so I met a traveller from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. So these opening lines, the speaker, Shelley, we can imagine, or somebody else is saying that they met a traveller from an antique land, possibly Egypt, probably Egypt, because that's where the statue is from who told him that in the desert there are these two huge stone legs sticking out of the sand and near them is a stone face which is half sunk in the sand and has been cracked and battered so it's a shattered visage and visage means face and then the speaker goes on to describe the face of that statue so he says whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions red which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things so you've got a description of the face of the statue the face of ozymandias and you can see that actually he's got quite a nasty expression on his face he's not he's not being described as a nice man in this poem and the sculptor is the one who has preserved that expression um, stamped on these lifeless things, the lifeless thing being the statue. Um, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. That could either be a reference to um, Ozymandias, the way he treated his people. Maybe he mocked them, but he also fed them. Or it could be talking about the sculptor who may have been mocking Ozymandias um, by depicting him in this way. So that's got a double meaning there. And on the pedestal, these words appear. So at the base of the statue, there is an inscription and this is what it says. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. So we can see that the purpose of this statue in Ozymandias' mind is to impress his power um, on the local state stakeholders. So people who might be wanting to um, kind of challenge him for his power. He's saying, look at my work and feel sad that you haven't achieved as much as I have but that inscription is quite ironic because around him now nothing beside remains so the whole ev all of his works his whole kingdom is gone round the decay of that colossal wreck boundless and bare the lone and level sands stretch far away okay so there's that image um that I showed you yesterday of the statue just in the desert on its own there's nothing around it and this idea that Ozymandias was once powerful is broken down because now he's kind of he's surrounded by nothing all of his power has fallen away it's been eroded by the passage of time okay so that is the main metaphor in this poem the fact that Whilst this man was clearly a very powerful figure in his time, now, in the present day, or when Shelley was writing, his kingdom has crumbled to nothing. There's nothing left. And this inscription, my name is Ozymandias, King of Kings, look on my works, you mighty in despair, that's become very ironic because his power has just disappeared. OK, so we're going to look slightly more detail at some of the bits of this poem so that you can answer the four questions on your worksheet. OK, so. Right. So who do we think? The main thing we need to establish today is who we think this statue is. So we've got this idea already that it is Ozymandias or Ramesses. It could be Ramesses the second. Or alternatively, this is an interesting um, way to interpret this poem. At the time that Shelley was writing in 1818 or thereabouts, the king on the throne in England is George III. He's a very militaristic king. Now, that means that he's involved in a lot of kind of battles and wars overseas. Um, and from what we know about Shelley, we can guess that he would be very opposed to a king like that. So it could be that 
Ozymandias not only represents Ramesses II, but that he also could represent George III, the King of England at the time. So that's a really interesting thought, because that would mean that this poem is not only about an Egyptian pharaoh, but it's also kind of a subtle criticism of the King of England. And that is why, if we accept that potentially Ozymandias is George, George III, um, Shelley needs to distance himself from the statue in the opening lines. He says, I met a traveller from an antique land who, to, who then tells him a story. And so he's putting that kind of a second hand story between himself and this statue and therefore kind of distancing himself and the from the opinions expressed in this poem. So that means he's able to kind of criticise Ozymandias and therefore George III and say that he wasn't a very nice man. OK, so we've looked at that and we've said that it could be Ramesses II or it could be George III. Um, then Shelley kind of uses a triplet to describe Ozymandias and it's not a particularly flattering description. He says he's frown and a wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. Now he uses kind of negative language there, frown and wrinkled lip and sneer to suggest that Ozymandias is a fearsome character, even though there's not much left of him, only a pair of legs and a face. So we get in this idea that this is not supposed to be a flattering portrait of Ozymandias. He is not a nice guy. Um, okay, and then we work our way down to this part of the poem and look at that inscription again. So my name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. And we've already said that that is ironic because there's nothing left of his works. Everything has been destroyed by the passage of time. Um, yeah, so that's the main metaphor in the poem that that time destroys political power. So once Ozymandias was very powerful and uh, clearly very feared, but now there's nothing left of his kingdom. The boundless and bare, it's boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Only the artist's impression of him lives on, only the statue um, endures. Ozymandias himself is gone and his kingdom is gone. Another interesting interpretation so somebody else that Ozymandias might represent, we can look at this phrase here, King of Kings. Now that might ring a bell because that phrase usually refers to Jesus. So in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, I believe, Jesus is referred to as the King of Kings. And we've also got a few other biblical type references because... Ozymandias himself, or Ramesses II, is the guy who persecutes Moses in the book of Exodus. So he actually appears in the Bible himself, Ozymandias does. And this setting, this kind of um, desert-like setting, is also kind of reminiscent of where Jesus spends his time in exile. So there's a few biblical allusions in this poem. And that could suggest that Shelley is kind of trying to criticise religion in this poem. So not only... Might Ozymandias represent Ramesses II? He could also be Ram he could also be representing George III, and he could be representing Jesus or organised religion, which is something that um, the Romantics themselves dislike. So the movement he was part of that's a key thing that they don't like organised religion. Okay, so we've looked at that poem in a little bit more detail. And now you should be able to answer the questions on your worksheet. But just remember, if you don't take anything else away from this lesson, that the main metaphor in this poem is that political power does not survive. OK, only um, only art can survive the test of time because it's only the statue that remains from all of Ozymandias' huge kingdom and impressive power. The only thing remaining is the fragments of this statue. Everything else has disappeared. And Shelley's saying, look, don't pursue political power because it doesn't it doesn't give you it won't give you eternal life, basically. OK, thanks, guys. Have a go at the questions on the worksheet and I will see you tomorrow.